there, and welcome to Roundtable here on Telil Community Television. I'm your host, Adam Cook. This week, our feature interview is with a familiar face here on our Roundtable series, the NDP MLA for Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Peer, Kendra Coombs. And we're also going to share several highlights from the recent Cape Breton Business Dinner, which took place at Centre La Picasse in Petit de Gras. Presented by the Cape Breton Partnership, the business dinner drew in several municipal, indigenous, and business leaders from across the island, talking about the past, present, and future of economic development on the local level. In a little while, you're going to hear the keynote presentation from the business dinner from former Alberta MLA and Cabinet Minister and author of the book 13 Ways to Kill Your Community, Doug Griffiths. But first of all, here are some of the opening addresses to the Cape Breton Business Dinner. You're going to hear in just a couple of minutes from Richmond Warden Amanda Mumberkett and from Budladek First Nation Elder Belinda Basque, who delivered the grace for the event. And we're also going to feature remarks by two members of the Cape Breton Partnership. First, someone you've seen on Telil Community Television in recent weeks, Martin Thompson, who is the Partnership's Innovation and Economic Development Director for Richmond County and the town of Port Hawkesbury. But first of all, here are the kickoff remarks for the Cape Breton Business Dinner from the Cape Breton Partnership's President, Tyler Mathis. Uh, bonjour et bonsoir. Je m'appelle Tyler Mathis. I'm the President and CEO of the Cape Breton Partnership, uh, Unamagi Cape Breton's private sector led economic development organization. I've said that a lot, but we, uh, we really believe that. We're very pleased to be here in uh, Richmond County as uh, Richmond County's economic development partner through the Regional Enterprise Network. Thank you for joining us today in beautiful Petit de Gras. What a gorgeous, uh, gorgeous community and a beautiful venue. Um, before I begin, I, I want to ex respectfully acknowledge we're in Unamagi, the land of the fog, part of Mi'kmaq, uh, the home of the Mi'kmaq since time immemorial. And we are blessed to be here and sharing this land together on behalf of the Cape Breton Partnership Board, investors and staff, and our many partners, including the municipality of the District of Richmond, our horse hosts. Um, we offer our thanks to the Mi'kmaq people for sharing this land, the sunsets, the sunrises, the coastlines, the shoreline, everything that we enjoy driving here to Petit de Gras, we, we greatly appreciate sharing this land. And uh, we value uh, this as newcomers and as descendants of newcomers who, who I am. And uh, we are a proud partner with our indigenous partners of Bolodek, Wigoma, Wagmakuk, Eskazoni, and Member Two. And uh, we are uh, proud to be here uh, with them in friendship as well. Well, all the as the LME watch you go and I have to learn how to the Mahan. Thank you for inviting me to say the opening prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the food, and I pray we have a good evening. Well, all you are telling me that you are always close, Mr. Choi, as Moksiga, Kilo. To all my relations. I want to absolutely start by thanking the uh, Cape Breton Partnership and the board members that are here this evening for hosting what I think is your first business dinner in some time uh, here in Richmond County. So we really appreciate, uh, we appreciate you coming to our, our beautiful communities to do that. Um, as you know, uh, Richmond County has uh, has an incredible history of uh, Mi'kmaq culture and history uh, in this region, as does all of Unimagi. But we also have a very rich Acadian culture. We are a designated Acadian community here in the county. And you are sitting at what I think of as the heart of our Acadian community right now in, uh, in Richmond County here at La Picasse. This is a beautiful facility run by beautiful people with an even better view. So if you didn't check it out, make sure you do so. Um, I think, you know, I just want to, uh, I'm not going to, I think I promised somebody a 30-minute speech earlier, but I swear to God that's not what's going to happen tonight. Um, but I do want to say that I think the future is bright for Richmond County, for Cape Breton Island, and for all of Inimagi. This, I think the key to that success, though, that we are going to experience in the future will be in maintaining a spirit of collaboration with our First Nations communities, uh, with our neighboring municipalities, and you know, we really, we really need to, we really need to continue that collaboration because we'll get much further if we work together as a team on a global stage than if we are trying to work individually. And I have to say that, you know, I truly believe that the Cape Breton Partnership does help us get there. So we'll allow them to you and your team, Tyler. 
And I'm really excited that all of our community members in Unamagi are, be, are able to be here tonight to hear it as well. Uh, we're honored to, to work with our municipal and our indigenous uh, Mi'kmaq partners. Uh, we're also grateful for the friendship and the uh, partnership we have with the province of Nova Scotia, with the other municipalities of the CB Ren, so the municipalities of the counties of Victoria and Inverness, as of course the, the town of Port Hawkesbury and the Indigenous Nations I've mentioned, as well as the Cape Breton Regional Municipality. With support with these partners and you, uh, we are able to continue our work of building a thriving and inclusive Unamagi Cape Breton, and we look forward to building that together for future generations to come. The, the opportunity for economic development that, that exists here, I have a background working in economic development for the Scottish Government, and it's, 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 it's crazy to, to come here and, and, and kind of see and hear about some of the opportunities that are here. The, the parts of, of the Highlands that I worked in was, was stuff we really had to, 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 to fight for. We have to do that here too, but um, there's a, a lot more momentum here than what I'm used to, let me just put it like that. Um, there's a new green energy industry on the horizon, and, and we're seeing historical investments in, in infrastructure here. And from what I gather as a newcomer, there's seldom been a better time to live, work, and invest in Unamaki, Cape Breton. So before we hear from our terrific keynote speaker, uh, I'll just quickly like to run through how the, the Cape Breton Partnership can support you in, in your business journey. So the Cape Breton Partnership is Unamagi Cape Breton's uh, private sector-led economic development organization. Our vision is to create a thriving Unamagi Cape Breton, and our mission is to transform uh, Unamagi Cape Breton into the most creative and prosperous place on earth. The partnership supports companies and entrepreneurs through our projects and initiatives by promoting our island as a great place to live, work, and invest growing a culture that values and celebrates creativity, innovation, and entrepreneurship, and connecting entrepreneurs and companies to the resources they need to succeed. Next slide, please. Uh, so we carry out a range of activities in order to achieve this. So there's a range of business advisory services we provide. We support businesses with red tap and regulatory challenges. We connect businesses with opportunities to grow uh, through initiatives such as our business planning services and our succession planning. We also work on investment attraction and promoting the region as a great investment opportunity. And as your economic development partner, we coordinate and manage economic development projects for our commercial land inventory, studies, research, strategic plans, and we support our municipal partners with priority projects that, that help move the island forward. One of our terrific programs is the microloan program for female entrepreneurs. So this is a partnership initiative between East Coast Credit Union, Sydney Credit Union, Straight Area Chamber of Commerce, uh, Cape Breton Regional Chamber of Commerce, Centre for Women in Business and the Cape Breton Partnership. So successful applicants to this program receive up to $10,000 interest free for the first six months. And in addition to the loan, you also get business planning support from the Cape Breton Partnership. You get a one year membership to to either the Straight Area Chamber of Com Commerce or the Cape Breton Regional Chamber of Commerce, and you get a one-year membership with the Center for Women in Business. So you can find more information on, 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 on this program and on how to apply on our website. Another initiative we support and manage is the welcometocapebreton.com website. Uh, this website serves as a one-stop shop for, the, for those looking to make Unamagi Cape Breton their new home, newcomers who have recently arrived to the region, and those who are newcomers to Canada. So it has a number of great resources from a service map, also um, information on how to join a welcome group in your community. And it was created to have a more welcoming and inclusive Unamagi Cape Breton, and it really is a great resource. It also contains sector-specific information for those who are, who are looking to invest on the island. Next, please. Um, the Cape Breton Partnership's business planning service enables entrepreneurs to take their ideas and turn them into professional and well-rounded documents for use in business startup activities, business expansions, loan applications, program applications, and many other uses. So some of the services and activities we can assist with include um, succession planning, development of business and marketing plans, budgets, funding and wage, subsidy applications, and again, I've mentioned business advisory services, and, and just general introductions to other service providers. Uh, we help entrepreneurs create over 100 business plans every year. Another great resource that we manage is entrepreneurcb.com, uh, which serves as a one-stop shop for all things entrepreneurial in Unimagi, Cape Breton. So no matter which stage of entrepreneurship your business is in, this website can, can help you find the tools and resources that you need to navigate your next steps. So to get, get matched with the right service provider, please follow the links to local resources. If you need extra help, our team will sit down with you and listen to your business ideas and needs. 
and we can then direct you to the right place. We also have the Cape Breton Job Board, which is Unamaga Cape Breton's online platform to unite employers from across the island to job seekers domestically and internationally. So due to Unamaga Cape Breton's changing demographics and anticipated labor shortages, domestic and international tra talent attraction will play a key role now and into the future for the island's growth and prosperity. So we recognize that newcomers are vital in growing Unamaga Cape Breton's economy. We've been growing as an island, and in order to keep the momentum, we need to grow our population to address labor shortages and enhance our communities. So the Cape Breton Partnership supports employers in attracting and retaining talent for immigration efforts. If you're looking to fill job vacancies in your business, we can support you to understand the immigration options available to you. We can also, also support local businesses to retain current workers by helping them obtain permanent residence in Canada. Some of the ways we support this work is through the Atlantic Immigration Program, the Nova Scotia Nominee Program, and through our Immigration Advisory Service and the Global Skills Strategy and the Global Talent Stream, all of which you can learn more about on kbreadpartnership.com. So yeah, please reach out if you'd like to learn more uh, or would like to access any of our services. Our team has staff located in communities across the island. I myself have an office in the Professional Centre in Port Hawkesbury and another one in the Municipal Offices in Arishat. And now here's our feature interview for this week's episode of Roundtable. Continuing our series of discussions with local MLAs and political leaders, we're pleased to welcome the NDP MLA for Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Peer, Kendra Coombs, to talk about recent developments on the provincial and federal government front and how they're impacting not only her constituents, but people all across Cape Breton Island. Here's my interview with Kendra Coombs right now. It's been a busy session for the provincial legislature here in Nova Scotia. A lot getting done, a budget getting passed. And we are now in a state where we're seeing affordability issues rise. Uh, in, in addition to gas prices, uh, genuine inflation has been happening. So with all of this in mind, what are your thoughts on how the provincial government is handling things at this point? and what you and your constituents would like to see happening in the days and weeks to come. Well, you mentioned much getting done, and I, I, I sadly, I, 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 I disagree. Uh, we haven't really been seeing much done. Yes, a budget was passed, but what we're seeing is a, is a budget that really didn't have much in it for, for Nova Scotians. Um, so there wasn't really much to talk about affordability. Um, anything that was in there was incremental. It was incremental. It was, um, yeah, and and so it wasn't really a budget of, wow, this is a transformative budget. Mm. It, there was nothing in that budget. Um, I think the premier said he was doing more faster, and I think, I think we said, you know, it's it's actually in many cases it's less slower. Um, what we saw in that budget, um, it, yeah, it wasn't really a budget that actually focused on affordability issues and on the needs of Nova Scotians. Let's talk a little bit then about what you might have liked to have seen in that budget and seen from this government going forward. And I mean, let's talk a bit yeah. about affordability. We know that grocery prices are on the rise once again. Gas prices just went up as a result of the federal carbon pricing initiative that's taken place. What are you hearing from your constituents about the struggles that they're facing and what would you propose to help them through this difficult time? So there was quite a few things that we were that we looked at, right? Uh, I'm trying to remember back and we talked about uh, cutting the grocery tax. Um, we talked about the this uh, a universal um, school food program um, with regards to particularly um, that was universal. So universal breakfast program, universal lunch program, the freeze on pharmacare fees, permanently indexing uh, the threshold for home heating programs like HARP, and as well as um, index indexing to inflation, um, the rate of social assistance. These were a few of the things that we were hoping to see. We were hoping to see, you know, um, a lot of a, a lot of other things, including making rent control permanent and close the fixed term lease loopholes, um, and you know th th those are a few, just a very few of the things that we were hoping to see within the budgets and with and you know coming forward. Now I am curious as well to uh, talking a little bit about 
gas prices going up mm -hmm. and carbon pricing taking effect, the Houston government spent $50,000 on an ad campaign that was designed to show what they're doing in terms of renewable energy and how that's allegedly better than a carbon tax. Do you think this was a good idea? And do you think that the Houston government could have done more or done things differently in terms of working with the federal government on the carbon pricing system that's now in effect, not just for gas yeah. stations, but also for home heating costs and other such things across the province? Yeah, so let's talk about that ad. Um, it's a partisan ad. It, so in my opinion, it was a partisan ad and it was a misuse of funds. Um, taxpayer money, um, Nova Scotian money should not be going, um, should not be used for partisan ads. Um, that is something that the PC party could have done. But I don't think it was appropriate for the for Tim Houston um to use that to use taxpayer money to fund a partisan ad and put the label of Nova Scotia on it. Um because it was misleading. It 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 didn't it didn't provide the whole story. Um it didn't talk about the rebate that people would be receiving. Mm -hmm. It you know and which people are going to be receiving this rebate quarterly. And that ad didn't discuss that. The ad didn't tell Nova Scotians that we as government and and the federal government, the federal government has never been secretive or um, never hid the fact that there was going to be a carbon tax. They've been upfront about the fact that a carbon tax was coming for years. Um, and we, you know, we the first the first we missed the first round of that in Nova Scotia. We had the um, the cap and trade program. Now I don't know if the cap and trade program worked or not. Um, but by all accounts, it you know we're nowhere further ahead than we were prior to the cap and trade. But we had, but Tim had Tim Houston, the premier, had two years. The Houston government had two years to develop a plan on on how to deal with carbon uh, that the federal government could have accepted. And I believe we were here the last time talking about the fact that it was a 10 page paper Yes. Um, that they gave. That's not a plan to deal with carbon. And that was all that they were willing to give after two, you know, two years in office and a gov and a and I'm sure a provincial government that was working on it prior to that, they had they had time to to uh, one provide a a program that would have protected Nova Scotians. From this carbon tax and a deal and provided a deal that the federal government could have accepted and they refused to do it they failed at doing it they refused to do it and then when they refused to do that um they also failed at negotiating a better rebate you know so with with ottawa they, they could have after when when we got the carbon tax coming towards us like other provinces, they could have focused on um, negotiating a better deal for Nova Scotians with regards to the rebate. And they didn't do that. Instead, what they did was use taxpayer money to do attack ads. Now, I will be speaking to your leader, Claudia Chinder, in just a few days' time. So we'll talk a little more about the NDP position on carbon pricing. But that being said, I am curious, Kendra, about your own feelings about the idea. Do you think it's helpful in terms of being able to gather funds to fight climate change? Uh, the idea that putting a tax on carbon use will deter excessive gasoline use, get us off fossil fuels or move us towards that? What are your thoughts about carbon pricing in general? It's a really hard one to talk to. To know because we we know we have to deal we have to deal with our car we have to deal with the carbon footprint we know we have to deal with our our our, our emissions um, especially I mean we're we're here we're Cape Breton right we're coastlines and we're watching and we're we're getting the hardest hit on when it comes to uh, when it comes to our storms now and our heat waves that we're that we're seeing and we are. And, our, and people are suffering from that. 
and we're, we're one spark from a wildfire, completely devastating our areas. And so there has to be something done to deal with, with carbon, with our carbon footprints and with emissions. And there has to be something done that we can effectively fight climate change. Um, will this work? I, I don't know. Uh, that's up for smarter people than me to, to figure out. Um, and I know where I'm, where my intelligence lies. And I, I just, I trust those that know exactly what they're talking about to tell me that this is, this is going to work. But again, I would say that what we need to, you know, part of fighting climate change is, fo is focusing on people, right? It's to make sure that we have a, a place that is safe to live in. Where, where the storms are not, you know, are not so life and life threatening and damaging our buildings and damaging more of our coastline and our resources. Um, so I think there's other things that we can do um, in Nova Scotia to offset those costs, right? So I, I think I list I listed them like you know freeze the pharmacare, um, cut the grocery tax. Um, the other things that we can do is raise the threshold for paying back um, the provincial student loans. Mm -hmm. So to like maybe to, to about 40,000, I think is what we're talking about. Um, immediately raise the minimum wage and create a plan to reach a living wage. You know, I think we need to do that immediately. Um, and, and so these are all the incremental things I talked about that we right now can do because the fact of the matter is the carbon tax is here. This was the federal government's plan. They they made no bones about it. So now, as no as the province of Nova Scotia, we now need to deal with how do we offset those costs um, instead of picking a fight with Ottawa. We now need to be adults and go. Okay, well, you know, um, the work wasn't done by our premier. The premier did not do the work that he should have done. He did not do the negotiating he should have done. Um, and so now we have a carbon tax because of that. Uh, well, a heftier, I should say, a heftier carbon um, tax because of that. And and now we need an end. Um, there was also a deal that was failed. Uh, now they failed to negotiate a better deal for Nova Scotians as well uh, for the rebate. And so now we just got to look at what are the things that we can do here in Nova Scotia to make life more affordable um for 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 our residents and so now we need to focus on that and and i i think that's where our our focus needs to be now is working on the things that we can control i wanted to ask you a little bit kendra about health care and mm -hmm. as you mentioned a little earlier on the province was touting its health care spending and its health care measures uh, one of the most recent ones is a $10,000 incentive for family physicians to take on an additional 50 patients and then another $200 per patient beyond that 50 if that actually works out. Your thoughts on this particular incentive idea and just the general state of the province's attempt to deal with healthcare, uh, not just province-wide, but here in Cape Breton Island, what are your thoughts? Well, I mean, I think it's it's their way of dealing with um, what we call orphan patients, patients without physicians. But again, it, it our problem is you can be attached to a doctor, which is you. We need to be attached to a health um, a healthcare family, a healthcare home, right? We need to be a doctor, what have you. You need to be attached to somebody because someone. We need a place for our records to go, right, and for our, our health history to be. But as you know, here like just say in Cape Breton, for instance, um, how many of us have doc have a family doctor who has way too many patients? You know, there used to be the time where you could walk into your, fa your you could call up and say, I think I might have strep or I think, um, you know, uh, I need to see the doctor, my family doctor, and you could get in within a day. You can get in with that within that day or the next day. You can't do that anymore. And that's why people are going to the emergency rooms. That's why they're trying to find a walk-in clinic and there's no such thing as a walk-in clinic anymore because they're because unfortunately their 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 family doctors have too many patients. So 
yes, it's good if we can give people um, a place, a, a healthcare home and a healthcare family and a doctor. But if you never get to see that doctor because they have way too many patients, you're still not getting the healthcare you need. And we see a lot of that here. So there's no preventative health care that's happening. And preventative health care is actually cheaper than reactive health care. And so, you know, if we had enough, um, you know, health homes and enough doctors, um, we could, there could be more of a, there, that could be the focus or in public health even, mm. more money into public health because public health was cut. You know, we went through a pandemic and then they cut public health care funds in the budget. Mm. Um, we could have been focused on preventative health care. Um, the government talked about being pro health care, but again, the minimum wage is still low. And without a prop, without, and so is um, social assistance. And without proper wages, without, um, without proper income assistance, you can't buy healthy food. You know, and that leads us to like the grocery tax thing as well. Like, um, you know, a, a full watermelon is is not taxed, but if you got it cut up, it is taxed. And not many people are gonna go and buy a big, huge watermelon, mm. you know, um, or, or things like that, especially someone who's sing a, a single person or a person, a family of two, right? So, yeah, so we, so that, so there was no, there's no consideration for that. Healthy food, there's no, there's no, no program. They're waiting on the federal, again, they're waiting on the federal, provincial, this provincial government is waiting on the federal government to do the lunch program rather than take the initiative and do it themselves. Um, the lunch, pro where, when children are fed, they learn, right? That's another part of mm -hmm. healthcare. Is is being is making sure your values are fed. There was nothing in there on housing, nothing in that budget on housing on on, on new public builds, new public housing. Housing is healthcare, and there was nothing there that focused on that as well. So, for this government saying they're focused on healthcare, the things that people need to have to be healthy, um, they're not focused on. They're focused on. Um, doing attention bonuses and stuff like the retention bonuses to keep people that they already have. Um, but there's no focus on building a system. There seems to be no focus on building this, that healthcare system that would actually start decreasing the amount of people that actually need to go into, into hospital or actually go into youth services for healthcare. The same can be said about mental health care. There's some, still nothing in there that talks about proper mental health care and preventative in that, you know, the stressors that create um, people needing to seek me mental health um, supports are again, making sure, you know, is financial. Are they, are they financially healthy? Do they have a home? Do they have stability? All of that. And yet we, we have that this, the Houston government has not focused on any of that. That would go to help eliminate our our, our our costs in healthcare and the strain that we're putting on our healthcare workers. As we wind down this interview, part of the reason that we lately have been speaking to different political figures, and as I mentioned, Claudia Chender, your leader, will be one of them in just the next few days, is because we're coming up on the two-year anniversary of the election of the Tim Houston government. You're now coming on the three years as we come on the two year mark for the Houston government, after being in this position for that long, are you still optimistic? Are you motivated? Do you feel a little bit disillusioned by what you've seen in the legislature and in government overall? Just basically, where is MLA Kendra Coombs at this point of her public service? I'm a new Democrat. I'm always gonna be optimistic, um, you know, optimistic and hopeful, you know, um, that those were the words that Jack Layton left for us as new Democrats to be optimistic, to be hopeful, um, and we change the world. That was those were the those that was his last message to us as new Democrats. And I I always hold those up um as to strive for. 
So I'm always going to be optimistic that we can create positive change, that I can effect in some ways positive change for my constituents, um, for Cape Breton, for Nova Scotians. Um, so I'm always striving for that. And I, I'll always continue to be. The moment you stop being optimistic, the moment you stop, you start becoming too jaded. It's the time you need to get out of politics, I think, because if you're, if you don't ever see the potential of what could be, um, then you're just going to sit there going, well, what's the, what's the sense of this anyway? Why am I here? Um, and so I'm, all, I'm, I'm hoping to always be optimistic. I'm hoping to always be striving for that positive change. Um, it's why when I make my interventions and I'm, and I'm critical of government, it's not to be critic. It's not to be negative. It's to say, this is what's wrong. Here's how we can fix. It. Here's the fix. Here, you know, here, here's the, here are the things that we can do to make life better. Um, and so always positive, always looking for the good, good opportunities and always try, always striving for change. Well, we have appreciated your optimism and your perspective both this morning and every time you've joined us here on Tell Little Community Television. Thank you. And it's been a pleasure to speak with you once again to catch up on nice. these issues. Kendra Coombs, thank you so much for joining me on Roundtable today. Thank you. Kendra Coombs is the NDP MLA for Cape Breton Centre Whitney Pier. We have been speaking to her at her constituency office via Zoom. Stay tuned for more of Roundtable in just a moment. Let's bring you back to the recent Cape Breton business dinner at Centre La Picasse in Petit de Gras. The guest speaker brought in by the hosts of the dinner, the Cape Breton Partnership, is a former Alberta MLA and cabinet minister. But for the past few years, he's been devoting his time to going around North America, sharing his thoughts about what he's learned about community development, especially in rural areas, and how many people make the same common mistakes in terms of what to do and what not to do to help their communities grow. The author of 13 Ways to Kill Your Community, Doug Griffiths, is coming up in just a couple of moments. But first of all, here's his introduction by a familiar face to many of us here in our little viewing audience, the Director of Communications for the Cape Breton Partnership, Jeremy Martell. I think I know quite a few of you here in the room today, and if you are from the local area, should be Jeremy Adonia Rose. I am from Samson's Cove. I grew up here in Alma Dam. I now live in Lusdale. So today we're here to hear from Doug Griffiths. Doug grew up on a ranch in small town rural Alberta, uh, and the name of that community, though it's close to Hannah, is Coronation. And Doug, being who he is, that I can personally attest, is very committed and passionate about building communities, helping communities, helping them identify what works, what doesn't work, what's holding them back, what they can take advantage of. Um, Doug served four consecutive terms as an MLA with the government in Alberta and served specifically as a Minister of Municipal Affairs, Minister of Service Alberta, as well as three junior positions uh, in agriculture, finance, and Solicitor General. He since went on to write a best-selling book, 13 Ways to Kill a Community, and stemming from that book, he's helped countless communities along the way find what works for them, what doesn't work, what isn't working, and maybe see what's right in front of them. The first thing Doug Griffiths shared with the audience at the Cape Breton Business Dinner at Centre La Picasse on June the 22nd, just because he served four terms as an MLA and cabinet minister in Alberta, doesn't mean he's still a politician. Yes, I was in politics. I served four terms as an MLA and a cabinet minister, but I've been through rehab, so I'm fully recovered. So <laughs> don't, don't worry about it. Instead, Doug Griffiths is now using the expertise he's gained from years in politics to travel around North America and share his thoughts on what could work and what definitely doesn't work in terms of stimulating community growth, building local economies, and attracting people to move to and stay in the places that he's visiting and trying to help. And the reason why I do this is because I think community building is the single most important job on earth. If we build strong communities, then our provinces and our country can take care of themselves. We need to go back to what's fundamental. 
And that's why I'm really excited to be here, because I think you guys have one of the best communities, most community-feeling places I've ever been. Topping Doug Griffith's list of 13 ways to kill your community, don't pay any attention to water quality. That's a message that resonates among Canada's indigenous communities, also in high-profile water contamination cases such as Walkerton, Ontario and Flint, Michigan. But according to Griffiths, having potable water is also important on a case-by-case -case community basis. And if you don't believe me that people find it important, I always tell them, go down to your favorite coffee shop tomorrow, your favorite gas station, and buy a cup of coffee. And just listen to everyone come up to the counter and complain about paying three and a half dollars for, for a gallon of gasoline. But every single one of them will pay two or three or four dollars for a little 400 milliliter bottle of water and not say a word because they expect quality water. And the quantity of water is equally important. I mean, I grew up on the, the farm. There's a rule of thumb on the farm. You buy the best seeds money you can buy, you put them at the perfect depth, you put on fertilizer so that it has nutrients, you put on herbicides to kill the weeds, you put on pesticides to kill the bugs, and you know what you get if it doesn't rain? <laughs> Nothing. You can't do agriculture without water, value-added agriculture without water. Tourism development happens better when it's close to water. You know that. Number two, don't attract businesses, especially businesses that compete with yours. I would go to communities of about 1,500 to 2,000 people that have one grocery store. And I'd ask the grocery store owner, how's business going? And they always told me the exact same thing. Doug, I don't know if we're going to make a living. I mean, sure, we're fine this week, but I don't know how much longer we can do this. We're going to go broke one of these days, just can barely hang on. But it was weird because I would go to communities of 1,500 to 2,000 people, same number of people with two grocery stores, and I would ask those grocery store owners to tell me about their business, and they always said the opposite. They would say, you know, we make a good living doing this. That didn't make sense to me. How could they not make a living being the exclusive provider and these two businesses have to share the clientele and they, they seem to be doing fine. And then it struck me, it's competition. See, competition gives us price, quality, selection and service. Better price, better quality, better selection, better service, better atmosphere, better experience, better everything. I would talk to people in this community with two grocery stores and say, tell me about your businesses. And they would say things like, well, you know, Sometimes they go into that one because they have a better price on canned goods, but sometimes they go into that one because they have a better quality meat product. And other people would say, well, sometimes I go into that one because they have a better selection of produce, but sometimes they go into that one because the bag boys carry the groceries up for me. Price, quality, selection, service. But I would go to the community with one grocery store and I would ask the public to tell me about their grocery store and they would say things like, well, Doug, I want to shop local. I know how important it is to shop local. I want my money spent local, but but I mean, I go in there and the milk is going to be expired the next day. And it costs $2 more jug than anywhere else. And I mean, I go in there and say, I'm going to have a barbecue with a bunch of friends. Can I bring in some special stuff? And they look at me like, you think I can afford to do that for you alone? I mean, sometimes I go in there and the, the owner is stocking the shelves and looks at me like, you have to come in here now. I'm busy. No price, no quality, no selection and no service. So where do you think those people went? down the street to the community that had two grocery stores where competition gave them better price, better quality, better selection, better service. Number three, <clears throat> ignore your youth. The nature of youth is to, to venture off, to meet new people, glean new ideas, have new experiences, see new things, learn new stuff, experiment with stuff. You hope it's not bad stuff, but that's the nature of youth. Your key to success is not to keep them, it's to let them go and to give them a reason to come home after they're done exploring and to let them use those new things that they learn. But we don't do that. In fact, in most communities, we don't just not give them a reason to come home. We spend half of our time chasing them out of town. Stop being so negative and critical. You have so many amazing assets and so much opportunity. But when you criticize your community, they believe it. And what do you expect them to do? So look, if you want to kill your community, ignore your youth. Youth is synonymous with the future. If you want to keep your young people, then you've got to figure out how to give them more engagement. I mean, I've had counselors look at me and say, no, 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 those young people, they can wait until they're 40, then they'll be ready for leadership. They don't know anything yet about the real world. Send the guy that can't connect his iPad to the internet. <laughs> we need co-leadership now more than ever. 
The world is changing so fast. We need young leadership to take reins or at least co-reign with us so that we can, we can move our communities forward. But look, if you want to kill your community, just keep telling them there's no hope and no future and they'll go away. And because youth is synonymous with the future, when they leave, your community will have none. Number four, deceive yourself. Now, there's two ways that I've seen communities do this, and it, they drive me insane. The first way is that they proclaim they're perfect. 54% of communities have the same slogan, the best place to work, live, and raise a family. Isn't that great when half of your competitors have the exact same slogan as you? And yet, 54% of communities have the same slogan. You keep selling something, and then you, you kind of push it too hard, so you overpromise something, and then people know it's a lie, then they don't believe anything you said. So it, it's worthless to say that you're perfect because it's not true and it makes people know you're a liar. The second way the communities do it is when they try and be like everybody else. And it, it drives me insane. I, I can see them do this. They, they want to do a strategic plan and they hire a consultant to do a strategic plan. And all the strategic plans look the same. Whether you're trying to be perfect or you're trying to be like everybody else, you're deceiving yourself because none of those things will help your community being su be successful. What helps your community be successful is what makes you unique. That's it. And it's so easy to find those elements that make you unique and make you stand out. And then you need to make sure your strategy, your budget, and everything else focuses on that. When you know what makes you unique, then you know who would want to live there. When you know who wants to live there, you know what they're looking for. You can find out where they live, how much money they have even how to advertise to them. And the exact words you need to say to make them aware that your community is there. That is a good strategy. But we don't do that. Number five, shop elsewhere. Every single chamber of commerce in the free world, especially during the pandemic, said shop local. In fact, when I did my MBA a few years ago, there's an economic principle that says every dollar spent in the community touches seven other hands on average before it leaves the community. So if I have a dollar and I spend it in your business, you spend it against yours, you get to spend it. Seven people get to spend it. It's like having seven dollars. But every dollar spent out of the community generally is gone for good. So shop local. Item number six on Doug Griffith's list of 13 ways to kill your community Stop caring about the appearance of local businesses or the community at large. Realtors will tell you about curb appeal. If you pull up to a, a place and it looks run down, the first impression, that curb, tells people whether or not anyone cared for it. I mean, if it doesn't look like it was taken care of on the outside superficially, your first questions are, I wonder if the furnace is good, I wonder if the water heater is good, I wonder, I wonder if they took care of the rest of it. And that, that's a, a deep, instinctive impression that people get. And so I tell people, when, when you look at your own community, what do people see? You may say, like my grandpa did, oh, that aesthetics is a nice to have. It's what's inside that matters. It's utility. Is it functional? Right? He would carry around that old paint bucket, never paint the bucket to make it look nice, but it didn't matter. It didn't have to look good. It was about utility. Except people aren't drawn to utility. They're drawn to beauty. I mean, I guarantee you not one of you ever in the history of your lives was ever at a party or a wedding dance or a bar or anything like that and looked across the room and said, oh my God, is he ever ugly? I'm going to go ask him out. You just don't do that. You're attracted to aesthetically pleasing things. And so I tell people, when people come through your community, what do they see? What impression do they get? I know you can be like, oh, it doesn't matter what it looks like. It matters to them. And if you're trying to get them to move there, have a tourism experience there, or anything like that, that's what's going to attract them. In fact, we did a survey across Canada with thousands of people to ask them where they lived and why. We took out everyone who lived in their hometown and everyone who lived really close to their hometown and asked them, why do you live where you do? And they all said it was a beautiful place to be. And now, post-pandemic, this whole work from home is garbage. It is work from anywhere. Anywhere across North America, as long as you have connectivity and high-speed internet, which if I redid it, it would be a new chapter one. That's like an essential service. So you, you can attract people. And you have the most natural beauty I have ever seen in my life anywhere. It's absolutely remarkable what you guys have to build on. But you know what? Hey, if you want to kill your community, don't paint. It might actually take a concerted effort to turn your town ugly, really, really mess it up. 
And even then, it's just putting an ugly cover on the book. But with time, no one will pick up that book to read. No one will be attracted to your community. And eventually, that, that illusion of failure, that ugly cover, will become a reality. And your community can then die an ugly death. Number seven, thanks, don't cooperate. This, to me, from my experiences over the last, well, 30 years of working on this, especially in the last few years, don't cooperate, to me, is the plague of the 21st century for municipalities. The failure to cooperate, the failure to, to, to collaborate is killing communities. Every jurisdiction I've seen that's successful is collaborating. Everyone that's failing refuses to. And I don't just mean between municipalities, I mean within municipalities. Successful municipalities have coordination between their, their municipal leaders, their administration, their elected officials, their economic development, their chamber of commerce, their volunteer boards, their schools, their everyone needs to collaborate and coordinate their efforts in order to be successful. But I can't, I can't believe how many don't do that. Here's the rule. If you want to kill your community, don't collaborate, don't cooperate with anybody else. Keep your organization and your municipality in isolation. Don't share your resources and figure out how you can work together. And I guarantee, as you, as you remain fiercely independent, your community will die alone. The number eight way to kill your community, according to Doug Griffiths, live in the past. Now, this section of his presentation involved a number of acronyms, or larger words, that broke down into a bunch of smaller words. Let's go through them one by one. First ones are the NIMBYs. You've all heard of NIMBYs? Not in my backyard. Now, they're kind of hard to deal with, but they're not crazy. Then you've got bananas. <laughs> Banana stands for build absolutely nothing anywhere near anything. <laughs> Banana. NIMBYs, bananas, then you've got cave people. Cave people, cave stands for citizens against virtually everything. <laughs> and I call them cave people because they refuse to see the light. I mean, you can turn them towards the opening of the cave and they go, ah, and they run back into the darkness. They don't want to see the light, they want the darkness, and they're, they're, they're critics. NIMBYs, bananas, caves. The next one are the nopes, not on planet Earth, nope. <laughs> now, th this group, this is, a, this is a big group. I'm gonna tell you right up front, I have no problem with religion, as long as you're not trying to tell anybody else what to do. The thing about religion is that it's based on faith, right? That's it. I can't prove it one way or another, so if you want to believe, it's pure faith. But somehow we got to a point in society where we decided that other things can be based on faith too. Even when there's evidence out there, we decided, nope, I don't care, I'm not going to believe anyway. They don't care about the truth or facts or information or any sort of transition. They want to believe their side is true and the other side is evil. That's dumb. That's deliberately choosing ignorance. Those are notes. And the last group are the fears. Fear stands for fire up everyone against reasonable solutions. <laughs> See, the first four, the, the NIMBYs, the, the bananas, the cave people, and the nopes will tell you why they're opposed to something. Fears aren't happy with that. They also want to make sure everyone else in the room is also afraid of that. And they do it by spreading fear and misinformation. But that's exactly what too many people are doing now. They're gaining control by spreading fear. So, but look, if you want to kill your community, live in the past. Don't plan your future. It doesn't matter if it's NIMBYs, bananas, cave people, notes, or fears. Give them the mic, give them the podium, and give them the power. And your community will be so angry about itself, so focused on what's wrong and who's evil, it will never actually plan its future and a course forward. And then your community won't just live in the past, it will become part of the past. Number nine, seniors. A lot of people get this impression that seniors are this cordial, easygoing group. Uh-uh, they're dangerous. <laughs> Oh no, I know, we get this impression that, that you know, they don't care and they're really easy going, they're all going to retire. Oh yeah, sure, they retire, they go travel some, they do more golfing, but they come home. And you got to think, for the last 60 years, your communities have been built by these people, lots of whom didn't get government grants and didn't have, have programs to help, they just did it by scratch. I mean, I still remember being a kid, handing nails to my grandpa, who used his own hammer from the farm to help build the curling ring. I know you can't do that anymore because of building codes and stuff, but that's their mentality and what they did. So when they come back from all that travel and golf, they want to help. Because once you're a community builder, you are always a community builder. So lots of great communities pull those seniors together as volunteers and give them something to do. They get to socialize, they get to help with their community. 
But I've actually had people say, no, 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 she is not getting involved. She was such a leader. If she gets involved, everyone will look to her for the answers, and it is my turn to be the boss. <laughs> yeah, that's insecurity at its finest. And so they leave seniors out, and they hope that they won't get involved, and that's, that's great. Seniors want to be involved, and they want a quality of life. And they will volunteer, and they will build your community because they're still community builders. So if you really want to kill your community, you've got to recognize seniors are the foundation of your community. They built it for the last 60 years. So force them to go somewhere else where they get appropriate housing and social enterprise, and then the foundation of your community will crumble, and your house will come down upon itself. Number 10, reject everything new. We don't appreciate what we have until someone else appreciates what we have. And so sometimes we take it for granted. I mean, people who live in Canmore and Calgary and Banff don't look at the mountains anymore because they see them all the time. I bet some of you love the, the sunsets, and the, but I bet sometimes you're so busy you forget about it. We forget that the whole rest of the world doesn't have what we have or what we have to see. So if you want to kill your community, reject everything new. Keep thinking what you've always thought. Keep thinking that no one else will appreciate what you've got, and you'll keep getting the same results. Number 11, ignore outsiders. Did you guys call them come from a ways here too? Yeah? I was speaking in PEI, and, and doing this presentation talked about outsiders, and a lady stood up when I was down in the conference, and we were asking questions. She said, I'm a come from a way, and that was the first time I'd heard the term. And I said, what does that mean? She said, well, I'm, I'm from somewhere else. And I said, well, what does that mean to you? And she was sitting with her friends. She said, well, when I suggest things, people look at me and go, you're not from around here. You don't know how we think. You don't know our history. You don't know our background. You don't know the way we do things. And they were all putting their heads down in shame. And I said, that's sad. How long have you been here? And she said, 24 years. <laughs> and I actually did calculations in Canada. I sent out surveys. Your parents have to be born there for you to be considered a local. So when someone new moves, it takes three generations before they're truly a local. What is the qualification of being local? I mean, be local amounts to, I fell out here, I guess I'll stay. It's a birth certificate. Like, that's, that's all it is. What makes you so appreciative of your community when you probably don't recognize what makes it great? Think about outsiders. They deliberately moved to your community on purpose. They thought, this is a great place to start a job, start a business, buy a house, raise a family. They picked it on purpose. The fact that you never left, I'm not criticizing it, but don't think that you know more than they do when you just didn't bother to leave. That's not a choice. That's the absence of a choice. But hey, if you want to kill your community, keep your outsiders on the outside and they'll go somewhere else and then you can have the inside tract on failure. Number 12, grow complacent. I ask people what sustainable means, and they don't mean, you know, solid and sustainable. They mean status quo. I want nothing to change. Except that doesn't happen. I mean, if you don't do anything status quo, I guarantee you, you will have a business close. When the business closes, that will be 13 unemployed people who have to go somewhere else to find a job. And they have to take their families with them. Less kids in your school, less utilization in healthcare, less volunteers in your community, less money spent. That 13 families not spending money might be enough to cause another business to close. So those people have to go find jobs elsewhere and they take their families. Less kids in your school, less utilization in your healthcare, less volunteers, less money spent. You see how it starts to spiral out of control? So I always tell everybody, don't say sustainable. Use words like vibrant, dynamic, aggressive, enterprising, anything that says you're gonna do something about your community. Have a vibrant, dynamic, entrepreneurial strategy. Something that says you're gonna do something. And then, if you're really lucky when you do that, when a business closes, another one opens, and those people have jobs, and they don't have to leave. Status quo is sustainable. If you're really lucky, no business closes, and the new one opens. That's 13 new jobs. That's 13 new people that could move to your community for those jobs. Guess who they bring? Their families. That's more kids in your school, more utilization in healthcare, more volunteers in your community, more money spent. 13 families spending more money might be enough for another business to open. 13 more jobs, 13 more families, more kids in your school, more utilization in healthcare, more volunteers, more money spent. You see how it can grow up? There's no such thing as this because the world is constantly changing. You don't live in status quo. If you want to be sustainable, you have to work hard at it just to stay where you are. And if you're lucky, you'll grow. But hey, if you want to kill your community, grow complacent. Have a nap. It will become a dirty. That one was dark. <laughs> Number 13, don't take responsibility. It's just that simple. I, you know, I'm going to say something about it. 
People always look at me and say, Doug, I'm not responsible for the, the price of gas. I'm not responsible for the oil industry or the lumber industry or the fishing industry or the federal policies or our prime minister or our premier or whatever. And I always look at them and say, you're wrong. I mean, you're not responsible. What you mean is you're not to blame. Those are two different words for a very specific reason. I mean, say you work for me and I'm a horrible boss for an entire year. And then I fire you on a Friday for no reason because I'm a jerk. You're not to blame for that. You're still responsible for what you're going to do about it. You go find another job, you file a human rights complaint, you, what do you do? I'm not responsible, you are. I'm to blame, you're responsible for what you're going to do about it. And it's the same in your community. You're not to blame for any of those things. You're still responsible for what you're going to do about it. So if you want to kill your community, you've got to pass on responsibility to somebody else. I don't care who it is. Pick a preacher, a teacher, a doctor, a dentist, a new business that's entering the community, a new industry that's coming, the prime minister. I, it really doesn't matter because none of them are as responsible as you are for determining the future success of your community. Right? You've got to pick somebody else. And then you can feel absolutely guilt-free. Last slide. While well, your community dies and not feel responsible for it. Here's my, here's my experience. I have discovered after working in provincial politics, doing federal stuff, 30 years of working on this, everywhere I've been, a group of people that decides it's going to be successful, I have never seen them stopped by any level of government, ever. But a group of people that decides they're meant to fail will find a way. Because they can't be helped by God herself if that's what they decide to do. Whatever you believe, you can make true. If you decide you're going to fail, you'll find a way. If you decide to be successful, there's always a way. And just for the record, if you feel a little bit inspired by this, a little feisty mood, you're going to go talk to people about it. And this is what you're going to hear. It won't work, it can't happen, it can't be done. I've heard it for 30 years. Well, that's going to make you want to feel angry. It made me feel angry all the time, and I used to get really angry. So when someone looks at you and says it won't work, it can't happen, it can't be done, don't get angry. Just do what I do. Smile at them and say, those who say it cannot be done should not interrupt those of us who are doing it and get back to work. And if you need a hand, give me a call. Thank you. It's great to be part of a community that we know that it does work, that it can happen, and it is working. So, you know, thank you for the inspiration. Thank you for the work and the collaboration and the partnership that we have in the room. And uh, thank you for the inspiration, uh, for sure. And, and, and thank you for writing books so that we can take this home and, and read it and apply it and remember it. We are proud to be here in Unamagi, Cape Breton, and to work with, again, our communities of Bodledeck, Eskazoni, Member 2, Wagogama, and Wagmacook, as well as all of the municipalities of Victoria, Inverness, Richmond County, of course, our hosts, the town of Port Hawkesbury and the CBRM, the, town, uh, the province of Nova Scotia, our sponsors, Bearhead and 3C Wealth Partners, thank you very much. The team at uh, Co uh, Louis Cozy Corner, La Pacas, and last but not least, of course, uh, Doug Griffiths. And there you have it. That wraps up this week's edition of Roundtable here on Talil Community Television. Thank you for tuning in, and a special thanks to my interview guest this week, Cape Breton Center Whitney Pier MLA, Kendra Coombs, who spoke to me via Zoom from her office in Reserve Mines. If you have any thoughts about what you've seen on Roundtable this week, or you'd just like to make suggestions for a future episode of the show, I'd love to hear them. You can contact me directly. My phone number is 902-625-8863, and the best email address to use is adamjrcook, cook with an e, at gmail.com. You can also get your comments and your suggestions into Talil Community Television in Arishat. The station phone number is 902-226-1928, and you can use the email address talil at talil.tv. As always, you can follow Talil on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok, and our YouTube channel features every single episode of Roundtable, including this one, as well as individual segments, interviews, and panel discussions from our shows, and we offer the same service for our sister program, Telil 24-7. For now, I'm Adam Cook. Thank you once again for joining me for this week's edition of Roundtable. I look forward to seeing you again next time with a brand new show. Bye for now.